The London Underground is a vital part of London. Every day, over three million people make their way into the underground tunnels and passageways without a second thought. Most of them travel completely unaware of the history of their surroundings. From the early days of construction through to wartime, there have been thousands of accidental deaths and suicides. Add these to the graves, cemeteries, plague pits and church crypts that the tube's construction has disrupted over the years, and the number of potentially disturbed souls begins to add up to the thousands. This is a journey through the oldest underground network in the world. For the first time ever, men who actually work on the tube have shared their stories. These previously untold experiences will reveal just how haunted the tube really is. You could hear the doors one, two, three, clunk, click. I know that I did see this image of a woman. And all I could do was just sit and look. It's a little unnerving. To this day, I, 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 I can't forget it. The rhythm of the tube's daily life rarely changes. Before the tube shuts for the night, commuters make their way home in various states, all desperately trying to make sure they catch the last train. Because if it left without them, they would experience a very different place than the one they're used to. The crowds would be gone, replaced by silent, empty and lonely stations and passageways. 24 hours a day, the CCTV from every station in London is monitored by a line controller based in a separate location. In the summer of 2000, the line controller noticed a man standing on a platform at Liverpool Street in central London. This was particularly unusual as it was two o'clock in the morning. The station was closed and there were no contractors scheduled to be there. On shift that night was Steve Coates a station supervisor with 23 years of experience. The line controller rang Steve and asked him to investigate. I asked him if he'd like me to go and have a look. Um, he said he would, as he'd seen somebody wearing white overalls standing in the entrance to the eastbound tunnel. I went down to the central line. I couldn't see anybody as I approached the eastbound tunnel. Um, there was nobody there. I looked into the tunnel, I looked all around. Um, there was nobody present. I walked through to the bottom of the escalators and used the telephone to call the line controller and I explained to him that I'd carried out an investigation, I'd looked through into the tunnel, I couldn't see anybody there. He said, but this guy was next to you, how could you not see him? So I said, okay, I'll go back and have another look. So I walked through, I looked all around there, again I saw nobody. I came back to the telephone, called the line controller and said, there honestly is nobody here, I've looked around. And he said, but I'm telling you, I can see you on my CCTV. You were standing right next to him. I said, are you sure it's not just a, a, a blip on your CCTV? And he said, no, the guy was right next to you. And I said, I can promise you there was nobody there. So he said, OK, all right, fine, thanks very much. As I turned and walked back onto the eastbound platform, to my left there was a bench, and on that bench was a white pair of paper overalls. At the time, it made a chill go down my spine. Had anybody walked out of the tunnel while I was on the telephone, I would have seen them. They would have passed the area that I was in. Um, and I certainly did not see anybody wearing white overalls or see anybody placing any overalls on that bench. From Liverpool Street, if you travel one stop westbound along the central line, you arrive at Bank. It's one of the oldest stations on the network and is situated in the heart of London's financial district. Andy Harkness worked for London Underground for 35 years. In 1982, he was working the night shift at Bank. The last train had left and he'd just begun locking up the station. I then went down the, the other lifts, four, three, two, one. I had a look in number one, although we hadn't even used the lift. And bearing in mind, these are the old lifts 
with the old wooden heavy doors. So I looked in the lift, nobody in there, it was clean, shut it down. As I walk across, or about six foot away from the number one lift, there was a knock, 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 knock on the door. And I thought, no, nah, that's not true because I've just looked in there, there's nobody there, there's nobody else in there with me, there was no winds, you know, occasionally you could hear these doors rattle, but it wasn't, it was a definite knock, knock, knock. So I thought, no, nah, this is not happening, so I carried on, ignore it, you know, go away, I'm saying to myself. I walk across then to where the switch room is, I open the switch room and I wedge open the door and then switch the lights off to the old emergency, uh, just left on the emergency lights and I've started to walk across the ticket hall. As I walk across, all of a sudden that door slams, wham, like that. And I, I wouldn't even look back. There was no wind, no nothing. And it was, uh, it scared the life out of me. And I said, no, 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 it's not happening. Like, and I said, I nearly made a mess in my trousers. And off I went, you know. And that was the last time I was working on that side of the station. And I was glad I never went back. As a passenger, one would hope that incidents like these at Liverpool Street and Bank are fairly few and far between. But the reality is, they're not. What would a, a spirit like that be doing down in the London underground? It's a strange sort of feeling when something like that happens, especially like if you just don't believe in it. It doesn't make any sense at all. Although one billion passengers pass through the 253 stations of the London Underground each year, there are still places where passengers never go. One such place is Kennington Loop, a section of track near Kennington Station in South London, where there have been more reported unexplainable incidents than anywhere else on the network. The loop is there to enable trains to turn around and head back north again. At Kennington, the carriages are cleared of any passengers, and the empty trains are sent into the loop, where they will often have to wait for up to 20 minutes in the 150-year-old tunnels. And while they're waiting, there is absolutely no way anybody could get on or off the train. Larry de Larabiti and Bob Cairn both worked on the Northern Line. Bob was a driver, and Larry was a guard. Together they have nearly 50 years of experience on the tube, and they both have extensive experience of travelling through Kennington Loop. 25 years ago, uh, I was a guard on the Northern Line. Uh, one day, uh, we were contacted by the line controller, and he asked us, because of uh, an incident further up the line, to divert to Kennington Loop. We detrained passengers, at Kennington on the southbound and then we move off and wait into the in the loop for the signal to come northbound which normally uh, that particular night it was sort of 10 minutes. We were there for quite a while uh, about five minutes or so um, which seems quite a long time when you're, when you're held there when nothing moving when I heard the interconnecting car doors going. Now this is a unique distinctive sound that the clunk click of the doors is, 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 is unlike any other on the underground. I heard the slamming of our communicating doors, which are the doors between in the middle of the train. You could hear the doors one, two, three, clunk click, again car five, six, seven. It got closer and closer and I thought, well this is strange. And so I stood up to look into the next car to expect to see my driver there, but nobody was there. And we actually searched the train through all the communicating doors, half the doors were open, but nobody there. You just think, how strange. It happened a few times, apparently. Um, the story goes that some, some passenger uh, was killed in the, in the loop. A man was killed at Kennington, trying to board the train in between the cars, uh, and as a result was apparently dragged into the sidings and was killed.
221 feet below London. The unique tunnels of the London Underground put passengers in an environment that they would never usually find themselves in. Could this have anything to do with the high number of strange experiences reported? Vic Tandy is a senior lecturer at Coventry University. He's been exploring the reasons and explanations behind paranormal experiences for over 20 years. He believes he has a simple explanation as to why there are so many unexplainable experiences on the underground. Most humans can hear between 20 hertz, that's 20 cycles per second, up to about 20,000. Um, infrasound then starts at 20 hertz and goes down. The effects of infrasound are that they can activate the fight or flight mechanism, which makes you feel cold, it makes the hairs stand up on the back of your neck, and so the whole system gets worse and worse, and if you do nothing about it, that in itself will cause um, visual disturbances, and you may see grey objects in your peripheral vision. To prove his theory, Vic would first need to find significant levels of infrasound in the parts of the tube where strange experiences had taken place. And the microphone um, just works in the same way as a standard microphone. The only difference is that this one is very sensitive to low frequencies. The first place he went to make some recordings was on the Northern Line at Kennington Loop. This is Kennington Loop. Um, and so this is where the trains actually come in and then they turn around and go back out again. And so one of the stories involves people having strange feelings in here. And so we're measuring the level of infrasound actually in the tunnel as we go round the loop. There's, there's actually quite high levels of infrasound showing on the trace. I want to actually stop it and analyse it and, and get a closer look. Um, but certainly, again, I think there's, there's quite remarkable levels, apparently. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to spend a few minutes looking at it more closely. Certainly at the point at which the train was stationary, for some reason, the level of infrasound became quite high. So we were talking about 90 decibels. In fact, at one point I've measured 95 decibels. Now, if that was audible sound, that would be a disco which would be just about as loud as you could possibly stand it. You would come away from that with your ears ringing. Clearly, it's not going to cause doors to bang and that sort of thing. But it might just be responsible for feelings of unease, which then other events might be more likely to sort of give a paranormal feel to. Much of the noise generated on the underground is made by the machines and motors that run constantly during the passenger hours, providing services that have become second nature to commuters, such as the 408 escalators and lifts in operation at any one time all over the network. At night, when the last train has left, it's the responsibility of the station staff to ensure that these are switched off and the silent hours of the night begin. Barry Oakley was a station supervisor working the overnight shift at Hyde Park Corner in November 1978. As usual, he'd closed and emptied the station and had shut the escalator down. Having checked that he'd properly removed the breakers, a piece of equipment that stops the escalator from moving, he and his colleague then returned to the supervisor's office. Now, all the escalators were off and everything was quiet. At about half past two, 25 to three, there was a commotion outside in the booking hall area, the concourse area. When going out into the booking hall area, we noticed that the escalator that we'd come up on was on, which I found rather strange because, to my knowledge, once the breaker was out, there's no current to that escalator. To start an escalator up, you need to physically use a key. And around about, it must have been about 20 past three by the time we got back and all this had gone on. And while I was making this tour, I had this terrible sensation that, in the back of the neck that something was watching me or, or something was, you know, there that I couldn't describe. And the room was really cold by now. It was just like a, you know, it's, you, you could see your breath through the coldness. And I turned around, and when I turned around, I noticed my colleague was like, up against the side of the table, against the wall. He'd gone white, like a, an off colour. I, I wonder if he was taken ill, you know, if he'd, something had happened. So I immediately gone to him, 
trying to bring him around. It took me about five or ten minutes to actually get him to come round and talk to me. He yeah. said, did you see the face? He reckoned someone's head had come through there and looked at the pair of us. Um, not long after that, he then decided he was going home, he wasn't going to stay. Tariq Rana was a station supervisor working at Beacontree Station, a quiet commuter overground station on the district line in East London. He was working a late shift one evening in the summer of 1992. He was about to go home and was finishing off some paperwork. In the office at Beacontree Station, we had a door that led onto the, um, onto the National Railways platform. While I was like, doing my work, I heard that door rattle. Um, I thought nothing of it at the time because the trains normally pass on that side. After a couple of minutes, I heard the door rattle again. So um, I thought, well, I heard it rattle the first time, so there must be a train coming. And then after another couple of minutes, I heard it rattle again. And, um, and then I thought to myself, well, it's now rattled three times. Um, the train, if there was one, should be coming. I got very uncomfortable with that. So, so I had another member of staff upstairs, so I thought I'll, I'll go upstairs. And, and, I, and on a chat with him. I walked on the platform, got to the staircase, but I just had this strong feeling that there was somebody walking behind me. And then basically at that point, I turned round and um, I saw an image of a woman. She had uh, long blonde uh, hair, uh, probably about halfway down to her back. Um, and she had no face. It was just, just something like a blank uh, where the features would be. And, and the funny thing is, every time I tell this story, I always get goose pimples. And I've really got them now as well, because I, I know that I did see this image of a woman. Anyway, by that time, um, I've approached my member of staff, and, and um, I remember his exact words. He said to me, you look as if you've seen a ghost. And, and I said to him, um, I, I, I think I have. And then he says to me, um, oh, is it a woman in a white dress? I said, yeah, how do you know? And he goes, uh, oh, I've seen her as well. From Beacontree Station, if you travel westbound along the Green District Line, you'll eventually arrive at Embankment Station in central London near Trafalgar Square and Fleet Street. The Embankment is one of London's busiest interchange stations. Over the years, many of the station staff and contractors have reported very strange feelings and unusual experiences in one of the station's disused tunnels which runs under the Thames. The tunnel it's called Pages Walk. Strange noises. Some have said they've heard footsteps. Others that the lights have gone out and then come back on again. You hear the door slamming, stuff like that. And then when you walk through the tunnel, it gets to a point that it's changing temperature. It does get quite cold down there, and it, it, it does give a very eerie sort of sense of, of a feeling down there. You're not going to get me to go down <laughs> with you. <laughs> One person who has no choice about going down to Pages Walk is a contractor we met while we were filming. He didn't want to be named, but he's been coming to work in the tunnel every day for the past three months. And the tunnel, rather than the work, is beginning to have an effect on him. I've worked all over London, places that got bombed during the Second World War. They never thought about anything like spirit, so I don't worry about it, just, just go on with your job. But Pages Walk, this one, it's different from day one. I felt like I wasn't wanted or I was somewhere where I shouldn't be. Some of the staff, I think, do believe there's something down here. Um, yes, I've thought about what it can be. I've thought of answers. What can make the doors bang? I don't know. I'm not saying there's something down there. I'm not saying there is or there isn't. I don't know. I don't want that job. We took Vic to Page's Walk to see if he could measure any infrasound and whether it would offer any explanation to the number of strange experiences. Oh, 
Well, the whole atmosphere of this place is incredible. There's a huge gale blowing through. The door is just closed in front of me. So, you know, the whole place has an absolutely incredible, incredible atmosphere. You get these cold blasts of air. Um, I don't know whether that's the trains moving through the tunnel, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, the temperature changes. You can actually feel, you know, the clothes moving, and I love the noise that the door makes. It's going to bang again. Well, we're about halfway into the tunnel, and the um, spectrum analyzer is reading quite a lot of low frequency sound. You can see that the marks down this end are quite high. It's feeling a lot colder. The, uh, the whole atmosphere now is, is chilled. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's abnormal. It's just changed. The um, start right down in the um, ne next to the station, the temperature was about 24. So we're a good 10 degrees lower up here than we were down there. I mean, that's pretty weird because you would expect it to get warmer. Um, but nonetheless, I think, I think the, the draft is actually blowing the air up here. The piece of tape is starting to move up the tunnel. And there's quite a draft. You can actually feel the, feel the draft moving. And that coincides with the door actually being in the closed position. So the draft's now dropped. And my guess is that in a minute, when a train going in the other direction comes, it will suck the air back out again. There we go. So that's now sucking the air in the other direction, which could move the door the other way. I think this is actually a classic example um, of the kinds of effects that infrasound can have. Um, you kind of feel this weird sort of um, presence almost. that the high levels of infrasound on the tube are responsible for some of the strange experiences. However, some experiences are not as easily explained. Without knowing, in 1983, a woman living on the outskirts of London had taken a photo on the underground that was to baffle the science world and involve her in one of the world's most famous murder trials. I can't understand how that image has been arrived at. It's all too inexplicable. Tunnels, stations and trains of the London Underground are home to unexplainable experiences each year. Usually reported by the staff who work in shifts to man every station 24 hours a day, seven days a week. However, sometimes it's members of the public who find themselves witnesses to unexplainable events. Millions of photos are taken of the Underground each year, most standing up in a holiday album somewhere. But the occasional photo ends up in the hands of someone altogether more unusual. One such photo, taken on the Bakerloo line in 1983, was sent to Morris Gross from the Society for Psychical Research. Over the years, Morris has examined and unraveled hundreds of unexplainable photos. When I first saw the photograph, I was astonished. I, there's no other word for it. I just couldn't make it out. The photo that Morris had examined was a picture taken in a carriage on the Bakerloo line by Karen Collette, who was showing her family around London. My nephew wanted me to take a picture of the underground, to have the brown framework, you know, of the train. So I proceeded to take the picture and didn't think anything else of it till some months later when I had the pictures developed. I handed the pictures to my father and my sister's boyfriend at the time and they were looking through the pictures and they looked at me and said, oh, that's not very nice. And I said, well, what isn't? And they said, that picture that you took. Karen couldn't believe her eyes. She'd taken a picture that science would struggle to explain. It doesn't make any sense at all. Here we have a photograph of a man sitting in an electric chair of all things, squared up, 
in the underground. Nobody, nobody obviously saw it, and yet the camera did. Now, what was the reason for that? Robert Cox is from the National Museum of Photography. He's an expert in analyzing negatives and images, and would be able to tell whether Karen's photo was genuine or not. The, the point with this is that it's an amateur camera. So to do uh, manipulation of photographs, particularly in the 80s, you'd have needed quite sophisticated cameras, um, quite expensive cameras that would focus closely and um, be able to control the exposure accurately. These negatives are from the 110 camera, an amateur point-and-shoot camera, with not the range of facilities to, to do manipulation. I don't think the photograph has been manipulated. After researching it, I found out that it was Bruno Hartmann, who actually, there's a waxwork of him sitting in the electric chair in the Chamber of Horrors in Madden to Swords. And I found that he was the uh, so-called kidnapper and murderer of the Lindbergh child, the aviator in the 1930s. So then the next thing I did was I actually went down to Mount of Swords. I walked in there, I looked at the, the man that was sitting in the chair, who happened to be Bruno Hotman, and what was shocking to me was that my picture was absolutely identical in buttons, in the straps, the way the hands were gripped onto the chair. And the only thing that was different with mine was that to indicate he's been electrocuted, there was blue sparks coming out of both fingers. I think it's a poster either outside or in the carriage behind, probably of something uh, that was happening in a show in London. A friend of mine um, whose mum had passed away asked me to go along to see a medium and I sat outside while she went in and spoke to the medium. Um, as she was about to leave, the medium came outside and said, I have a message for you. And I looked at him and said, but I'm not here for a reading. And he said, um, it's about your photo. And he said, just want you to know is that the man said, I'm accused of something that I didn't do, but I did something else. And that was the end of the message. The King William Street Tunnel is one of the oldest and longest disused tunnels on the network. Abandoned in 1900, it stretches from Borough Station to the north side of London Bridge. Prince Holman was a project manager for the Tube Centenary celebrations during the 1980s and was asked to photograph the tunnel for a book. He and his colleague returned on several occasions and each time they witnessed the same strange feelings. We did a lot of experiments to get it right and when we took the final set of photographs there was an image of somebody standing in the sump. It was slightly translucent. Um, nothing was right about it. There's, there was nobody who could have been there at the time. And I have this slide, and the slide just has written on it, the ghost, which is what we called it. Never thought anything about it. It's just been filed away for years. I went to pull it out, and the transparency is not there. I just checked to see if it had been misfiled. And look through some early images of shots we've taken down there. And surprisingly, there is another photograph of the ghost in almost exactly the same position that was taken a couple of years earlier that I didn't even know about until today. Bank Monument Station connects six different tube lines, making it the station with some of the longest tunnels and corridors. Cliff Archibald was checking the CCTV monitors in his office after he'd emptied and closed the station. At two o'clock in the morning, he noticed something strange. I noted what appeared to be a little old lady standing in a long corridor at a dogleg junction. So I collected a station radio so I could maintain contact with my colleague and made my way through the station. As I reached the same level that she was standing on, she looked up, looked straight at me, 
looked down again, turned, and started walking away. I actually started running down the corridor in order to catch her. By the time I got to the dog leg, she disappeared, which I immediately thought strange as I knew I'd covered that ground an awful lot quicker than she could have walked from the dog leg to the stairs. I went down to the spiral staircases. Both sets of gates were still closed and padlocked. She was nowhere to be seen. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or spirits or anything else like that. So I wasn't going to accept the fact that something pretty spooky was going on. So I called to my colleague in the operations room to check the CCTV cameras to find out where she could have disappeared to. He checked over a hundred cameras and there was no one to be seen. Looking back at my experience at Bank Monument on that particular evening, being the skeptic that I am, it will stay with me for the rest of my life as to why I can't come up with a logical explanation as to what happened. There are thousands of staff who work behind the scenes of the underground, keeping the network moving, clean and maintained. And nearly all of these jobs take place at night when the system is closed to the public. Some jobs are more unusual than others, such as the fluffers who collect human hair from the tunnels, blown in from people waiting on the platforms. Paul Fisher, who now works at head office, was training to be a manager in 1984 when he was asked to walk the tunnels of the Northern Line. Part of his training was to understand the procedures for all of the different tasks at first hand. And one such job Paul was required to experience was track walking a job that involves walking on your own along the tunnels between stations after the trains have stopped with just a torch for light. During the walk, uh, I think I was between Oval and Stockwell stations, uh, I came across this clearing, this bigger piece of tunnel, and there was a guy work, working there. And what struck me was that he had one of these old oil-type gasty tilly lamps, he used to call them, and I remember thinking that I'm sure these have been done away with, uh, safety reasons, I guess, and everybody had battery torches nowadays. So I said to this guy, I mean, he, he looked old to me then, he's probably my age now. Uh, I said, I'm surprised you got one of those old lamps. And I forget what he said exactly, but something along the lines of he liked it better uh, than, than the battery jobs. I never thought much about it. I asked him, what is this place, this clearing? He said, oh, this is South Island Places. And I forget what he explained what he did. Uh, and that was it, really. A quick chat, and I continued walking down the tunnel to the next station, which was Stockwell, and that was where the end of my track walk was. So I phoned this chap up, told him my name, and said, I've just done the walk from there to, to here to there. And I was now clear of the track. He said, fine, OK. And just by chance, I asked him, uh, what the other guy's doing up South Island Place? I thought I'd drop that in, be a bit clever, you know? And he said, what other guy? Well, I just spoke to a guy up at South Island Place, he called it. He said, oh, I haven't got anybody booked in my logs tonight to be working there. I said, well, there is somebody working there. I just spoke to him. If you're sure that you saw somebody down there, we certainly don't have anybody booked in for that piece of track. We'll have to search the tunnel. So as a tunnel search had to go ahead. So I've gone back into the tunnel and he's come the other way. And after about 20 minutes, we've met in the middle. And this old fellow with the lamp is nowhere to be seen. It's a little unnerving because it, it didn't kind of make sense. And the search had taken a long time. And as a result of that, the first trains had to be held up, which is not a popular thing to do. Uh, and I remember the, the worst part about it was that my trainer was now interviewing me for, in kind of a, a semi-disciplinary -dis sense because I'd delayed the trains and he wanted to know why. So I told him this story. And I remember he gave me a very old-fashioned look. He said, you know about South Island Place and the ghost stories, do you? So I said, no, and I'm sure he didn't believe me. And this was getting worse by the minute. And he said that there was a myth about some old guy had been hit by a train and killed. 
donkey's years ago, I've no idea when. And there was supposed to be a ghost down there. I said he gave me a very sideways look, and I'm sure he thought he was winding, I was winding him up. So I've kept stung ever since. John Graham was a station foreman and was alone working the night shift at Bethnal Green, a station on the Central Line in East London in early spring 1981. As normal, up to the last train, everything, staff was, staff went home and everything, and I just secured the station and just went back to the office and started doing some paperwork because all the staff had gone home. Put some of the station lights off. And all of a sudden, I was just sitting there and heard the sound of children crying at first. And I, I dismissed it as a nothing, really. And then all of a sudden, it seemed to get sort of loud. And then all of a sudden, there was voices of women and, and people screaming and, and, and loud noises and combination of everything. It built up to quite a, quite a frightening situation, really. It went, seemed to go on for about 10 or 15 minutes. And it was just like a if people were panicking to the point I left the office and I went up to the top of the booking hall and remained majority of the time. I, just, I was frightened to go back to the office because of the noise down there. It was, it was quite frightening, actually. Well, I even when I go through Bethnal Beth Green to this day, I, 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 I can't forget it, you know. It, uh, it's, it's frightening, really, actually. Of the 173 people that died at Bethnal Green, only 27 were men. The remaining 146 were women and children. Although infrasound alone could never offer an explanation as to why John heard the women and children's voices, it could explain any strange feelings. We took Vic Tandy to the station to see if he could put his audio expertise into practice and find a possible explanation for the strange noises. This is the station office at Bethnal Green where the um, person was reporting feeling strange feelings that then led on to him hearing screams. So we thought it would be legitimate to measure infrasound in here, see if there is any infrasound which might have, have been implicated in that. And then we'll go out and do some experiments outside. I'm getting breathless. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, I don't know why I'm getting breathless. Is it very high in here? Hang on. It's about 80 dB. After testing for infrasound in the Bethnal Green office, Vic made a recording of the ticket hall. He electronically simulated the frequencies of a female scream from outside the station's three entrances and recorded them to see if the sound would behave in an unusual way. The blue represents a frequency which is uh, equivalent to a female scream and you can see that it stands out quite clearly so it is quite possible for all uh, people to hear sounds from outside the station within the ticket office itself. It may be that in this particular case the infrasound might lay down the sort of context, it might make the person feel a bit uneasy to begin with um, and the test that we did did show that sounds from outside the ticket hall could sound inside the ticket hall. We can't obviously say for sure but at least we know that sounds from outside can sound as though they're coming from the ticket hall itself. The idea of ghosts keeping station staff company and travelling with everyday commuters is not a new one. In fact, there are dozens of stories that circulate around the network and staff. Rumours such as the Bakerloo Line passenger. When sitting on the Bakerloo Line, travelling northbound, apparently you can sometimes see the reflection of someone sitting in the seat next to you, even though the seat is actually empty. 
The dead body train is widely reported to have run in earlier parts of the last century. The tunnel, which is now bricked up, is believed to have run from London Hospital to Whitechapel. The train carried nothing but dead passengers to the station. Anne Naylor was murdered in the 18th century. Her screams are reported to be heard on the platforms of Farringdon Station. People have nicknamed her the Screaming Spectre. Despite any rumors, one thing is for sure. As the underground expands, more graves are being disturbed. And with it, the number of unexplainable experiences is increasing. The hairs were sticking up straight on both arms. And I could feel it on my neck. It was like a tingling, like static electricity. The Jubilee Line is London Underground's newest line. However, the extension from Westminster near the Houses of Parliament to Stratford in East London dug its way through the grounds of several monasteries, forcing the relocation of 683 exhumed graves. It's reported that sightings of monks have increased in this part of the network ever since. Just like every other line, the entire 45 miles of the Jubilee Line is checked each night on foot by track-walking patrolmen, walking the lengths of the tunnels on their own. Bill McCown is a track walker and has been patrolling the tunnels of the underground for nearly 20 years. He was walking along the northbound Jubilee Line from Baker Street to St. John's Wood in the early hours of the morning. He'd sat down in the tunnel for a break. So all of a sudden, I heard this noise. Now, there's no bolt holes that side or that side, anywhere. So the next thing, I seen the ballast moving a few meters away. I just sat there with my mouth open, watching the footsteps in the ballast as the ballast sank down with footsteps. You know what I mean? As I was sitting there, the hairs were sticking up straight on both arms and I could feel it on my neck. It was like a tingling, like static electricity. And it just went on past. And after that, when it got about 10 metres away, it just stopped. But uh, the main thing that worried me was I still had to walk in the same direction as whatever this was went, which was a little bit iffy. But obviously I had to do it because I was patrolling. I got back to Charing Cross from Finchley and I was talking to the ganger man. And when I walked in, he says, God, oh, Bill, you look very white. I says, I know you're not going to believe this. And he says, don't tell me you've seen footsteps in the ballast. I said, how did you know? He says, you're not the first person that has seen it. I said, well, what has happened? What, what do you think it is? He says, well, from what I hear, there's been a patrolman who used to walk that part of the tunnel, but he died. And he is actually still walking the tunnel as a ghost, patrolling, because he still doesn't realize he's dead. Reports of ghosts on the underground are apparently becoming more frequent. However, some stories still remain more famous than others. The Covent Garden ghost is probably the most famous of all. But as the station gets busier and busier, he gets seen less and less. It seems that he has the same reaction to crowds as the rest of us. The last reported sighting of the ghost was in 1972. Christopher Joseph Clifford was a young lift operator at the station, which at the time was used mainly by nearby market traders. Christopher had emptied the lift after the last train and had been closing up the station for the night. Then I went down and I put my TV on, not my TV, my radio, you know, the portable radio. And then uh, and that, and then I don't know how long it was, could be five minutes or something, and something made me turn around. And there's this tall geezer was standing there, 
six foot four or six foot three. He's always uh, taller than me, probably that way. And he was dressed in old fashioned clothes. He must have what you call type of a waistcoat, you know what I mean? Because his coat was up like that, see? Because he's got a waistcoat. He had a tall hat on him. So I said, OK, sorry. I locked you in. I thought he must have walked up all those stairs. You know how many stairs was there? So I reached over to get me keys, and there now, when I turned back, he was gone. I says, where did he go? I says, he's gone downstairs. I went down and I looked on both platforms, in case he was standing there looking for a train. No sign. Somebody showed me a photograph that was taken. He said they looked like him. I said, I spit an image. I said, where'd you get that from? But the block's been dead. Years and years, a hundred years or more. It never crosses most people's minds to descend 150 feet underneath London to the tunnels, corridors and stations of the London Underground. It never crosses most people's minds that the network that gets us all to work and home again is possibly one of the most haunted places in the world. Passengers can become over-familiar with their surroundings, which may be a mistake. In 1860, a Dr. Cumming announced that the forthcoming end of the world would be hastened by the construction of underground railways, burrowing into infernal regions and thereby disturbing the devil. So next time you're on a crowded tube, you may take comfort from the fact that you're not on your own. And if you aren't on your own, will you ever be absolutely sure that the person sitting opposite you isn't a ghost? <laughs> <laughs>